the Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Dash Technology Group, ABN 93603 824 835, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Welcome to Your Next Client Is You, an ensemble podcast series dedicated to revolutionising financial advice practices with technology. Each episode, we're peeling back the layers of tech implementation, guided by the real-life experiences of a diverse group of advice practitioners. Whether you're tech-savvy or just beginning, they've been where you are, researching, choosing, and triumphing in the tech maze. So, are you ready for insights and inspiration to revamp your practice? Then let's dive in. Are you looking to introduce unprecedented efficiency in your practice? Dash solves the entire spectrum of advice delivery, allowing you to streamline your practice in ways you haven't been able to before. Automate your execution from customized websites to CRMs, modeling, and SOA generation, executed straight into the Dash investment platform. We offer an array of in-house apps and collaborate with third-party vendors to bring you the best solutions. Curious about what your peers have accomplished in their practices with Dash and our integration partners? Have a listen to some practice insights that are sure to get you thinking. Oh, hello and welcome to this super special Ensemble podcast mini series where we, you're already experienced now, but we're diving into the five stage advice process we know so well, but applying it to the technology we choose within our practice. And we're getting great insights from uh, advice practitioners from within the Ensemble network, along with some insights from the team at Dash. I'm Peter Diamantidis and the guests joining me here today are Andrew Grinsell from Cooey Wealth Partners, Courtney Walker from Fox and Hare and Nigel. Baker from Arch Capital and Cientium. Welcome, folks. We're three in. <laughs> Lovely to, Great be, to here. be here. Thank you. Perfect. So, episode three, we're going to be covering off the analysis and selection. So, you guys did all that hard work. You you understood the practice and its needs. You then went out to market, did a whole lot of research, and now whew, we've got all this information. How do we go about actually picking a technology partner? Um, so to bring us all in line again, just so the listener can remember where we're at, I'd just love to cover off quickly the tech, like the sort of category of tech solution you were looking for, just so they're on the same page, and then we can dive in. Andrew, do you just want to cover off which, well, which one you started with and when you ended, what you ended up with in terms of the um, type of tech solution you were looking for? Yeah, absolutely. So because our business has um, different areas, so the property accounting, mortgages, financial advice, uh, we were looking for a CRM that would cater to the needs of all areas of the business. Uh, what that ultimately led to was a complete rebuild of the advice tech stack because the the final uh, CRM that we, we did go with um, it was is not just, or it's not like your traditional advice CRMs that try and do everything. That is a pure CRM and uh, that then meant that we had to look at the other areas as well, like your um, you know, financial advice modeling, um, document generation, research comparisons, everything. So for Courtney, how about you guys? What was your sort of particular project and what were you guys looking for? We were really looking for something that would allow us to connect with our, our members and something that our members can also use. So very different to Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> and you're probably really grateful for that, having heard yeah. his journey thus far. <laughs> we consider him the superhuman out of the teams thus far in terms of what he was embarked on. Although, Nigel, I've got to say you you haven't embarked on something that's particularly small. Just talk us through, you know, the sort of category you guys were looking at, which is quite different. Yeah, Peter, so we um, we were looking for a solution to help those uh, younger clients and children of clients and those that I suppose didn't meet that cost to serve dynamic um, and went through that whole journey of, you know, do we go out and use a robo-advisor or a direct service and decided uh, crazy enough to try and build it ourselves. So, um, yeah, so it's been a bit of a different journey, I suppose, but um, yeah, uh, lots of lots of lessons. Yeah, absolutely. And so for each of you, I'd love to get a little practical for a minute. Um the ensemble community really loves the little nitty gritty, little nitty gritty details. 
clearly I need another coffee. Um, and so I'm curious for each of you and Courtney, we'll start with you. You know, you went out and you might have done demos and you're sort of pulling together a whole lot of these different ones that you were considering. How did you actually collate that so that you can look at it and then decide what to pick? Like what was the collation? Was it a spreadsheet? Like how did you pull that info together? Yeah, so we actually did a lot of work first and foremost on the design side and and really understanding and defining what it was that we wanted to get out of a tool. So we almost, I I suppose, created the process before finding the tool, which made it really easy for us to go to the market and sort of say, yep, great, this is what you've got, this is what we want to implement how well does that align and and how close can we get it to to what we want without having to make too many adjustments. So there wasn't, in the end, there wasn't a need for a big spreadsheet. It was sort of just, yeah, there was, it, it was really just the design phase and then sort of matching that based on what each tech solution we looked at told us. So. so almost just to to sort of bring that down for somebody out there listening, then you sort of had your really detailed spec and it was sort of either a thumbs up or a thumbs down each time somebody did a demo. It's like, could they be in or are they definitely out as you sort of went yeah, and yeah. you narrowed it down? Is that fair? Exactly. Is that a, a- yeah, and we okay. narrowed it down. Yeah, that's right. And and it was really good because most tech providers sort of, you know, really dived into what we had created and almost like a checklist sort of went, yeah, we can do that. No, we can't. Oh, we could do this, but you'd have to do it this way. So okay. it made it really easy. Yeah, perfect. Nigel, I'm a bit curious about your process, given that you were looking, um, you know, learning management systems, those sort of tools um, are not something you would have had experience for. So I'm betting that it was a bit of a, a longer process and therefore a lot more information you were trying to pull together was a bit more uncertain. So how did you guys get your head around the options and collate those so you can line them up side by side? Yeah, Peter, like I sort of had, I had a vision of what we wanted to create and I suppose first and foremost went out to the, the – within our own industry and tried to see is there someone out there already trying to build this, whether it was one of the existing providers. Um, when that became evident, that was, and we sort of started just to talk to other tech people as to what they thought, other people in banking and finance or general tech businesses and, and failed to, to, to start with, like, you know, had some had some misfires, absolutely. Um, and, you know, and spent it, luckily didn't kill us, but spent a bit of money that was, um, you know, burnt. But, um, you know, you just got to keep, kept asking and kept trying to find people and it came down to some, you know, some relationships and sometimes there's people right in front of you you didn't think of asking to start with. So, um, yeah, okay. you know, that's a, that's a lesson to learn. Uh, with the investments, because we wanted to still have an investment solution to, to be brilliant honest it was just whoever would talk to us because we were a startup and the big providers basically laughed and said yeah come back to with you know when you when you've got decent money so it's sort of like chicken or the egg type thing go so we had, went with a, a sort of a startup rap provider who would be who are happy to connect to us and give us a shot which um so uh, that was as simple as that for the, for the yeah solution. okay and <laughs> like, so once it, it was really, <laughs> yeah so yeah. it sounds you're similar to Courtney where there wasn't something like a place where you were sort of collating this together and you know ticks and crosses and that sort of thing it was as oh, you went sort of is, is that fair yeah yeah, it's a bit. You look, there's a bit of an idea, but obviously there's a lot of um, there's a lot of randomness going on as well. Yep, yep, fair enough. Andrew, I'm curious for you because clearly what started with one thing then evolved into more. Did you have a structured way to collate what you were sort of investigating, or were you also a bit more like like we'll keep the ones that sound, you know, sorry, we'll keep them on the list if they sound okay, they'll drop off as they don't, or did you actually have some structure to the way you analyze them? No, we certainly did have a fair bit of structure to it. So we started off with uh, an Excel spreadsheet, which is one of the things we're actually trying to minimize the use of because we, we use a lot of Excel spreadsheets, or we did, to stitch data together across different parts of the business. Right. And to get away from doing that so much, we ended up using an Excel spreadsheet. Um, <laughs> But effectively, what we did is we, you know, for the CRM, we we sat back and we said, all right, well, let's have a look at everything that we we must have. So, what, what are the must haves? What what would be nice to have, and what doesn't really matter all that much? And listed out all of those things, and you know, must have ended up with fifty lines in this spreadsheet. Uh, and then went out and started looking at all of the options that were available in the market, and going down through the, you know, the the must haves, really focusing on that first, and if. You know, they didn't have any of the must-haves or the non-negotiables. That was it. We just wouldn't go any further with it. And then that sort of gave us our initial cull down to a smaller number that we were then able to move on to, okay, what are the the nice-to-haves and started working through that side of things. Uh, So, 
certainly was a, a structure to it and you know initially we tried to speak to anyone and everyone who was involved in the um the crm space um that can be used in financial services and um yeah, before long, we, we had a, a pretty good short list that we went into deep due diligence on. And so it's interesting. It sounds like for each of you that once you'd done the structure in terms of what you wanted, so where you had a good sense of that, then it sounds like you managed to narrow d- things down pretty quickly. Like it didn't become as long as a piece of string because something either could stay on the list or it had to go. Like you say, the must haves. If you don't have mm. that, I'm sorry, we just can't continue. Is that fair that that sort of really being careful about defining what you want and then measuring things against that meant it narrowed it down quickly? Yeah. So, for us, one of the must-haves was open APIs and right. that allowed us to halve the list of right. um, available CRMs yeah. you know, very quickly. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Is there any of those for, for either you, Courtney, or Nigel that really just meant a whole lot of things dropped off? Was there a feature that just meant a whole lot of things, you know, just for you guys that it didn't have and therefore you went, you know what, <laughs> I'm not going to be able to use you? Yeah, for us, it was definitely the client app. So, you know, there's not many companies out there that have a very good client app and even less that have an app that you can sort of tailor. And for us, we really wanted that fox and hare feel when our members logged into their app. Can't really get that on the market. So so for us, um, that was sort of the cut down point. Yeah, useful. How about you, Nigel? Was there anything in particular that sort of started to knock people off the list? Yeah, well, we sort of knocked everyone off of this, Peter, I suppose, because we, we, had, a, <laughs> we had our own view vision of what to do. So, Fair enough. Um, so it made it, uh, made it hard for ourselves. But, uh, yeah, so – but like Dash, obviously, who's um, – this podcast, they were you – know, they're, they're the investment in, or the – you know, the, the, I suppose the, the reporting system behind the scenes. But um, everything else we've sort of had to start from scratch, I suppose, and find new ideas because nothing that existed in our sort of ecosystem was going to fit the purpose of what we're trying to build out. I'm a little curious to actually, um, and this might apply particularly to Andrew and Courtney, was there any features that became a bit of a distraction as you were looking where you, you know, when it's that oh squirrel stuff with, oh, but maybe we can include that and it can distract you from a moment from the project you're on. Were there any of those you came across when you had to pull yourself back to your list? Courtney, did you guys come across any of those that sort of became a bit exciting and, you know, you lost track for a minute and then had to remind yourself why you were there and what you're looking for? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. I'm just sort of um, thinking through the different things that, that we were looking at. I think for us, given we were so well planned and, and really defined in what we wanted to do, that probably made it less likely for us to get awesome. distracted by the squirrels. Yeah. Um, but I think one of the biggest ones is modeling. You know, you get really excited by the idea of cool modeling. And yeah. so there was a couple of times where we went, oh, you know, should we give up this for the prospect of this amazing modeling? And we went, right. no, no, this is exactly what we're looking for. <laughs> Let's just, you know, yeah. keep on the, on the right track. <laughs> Stay on track. How about you, Andrew? Were there any of those that, that uh, were a bit shiny for a moment that distracted you guys and your team? Yeah, there was. I mean, there was one that we went with uh, f- on the modelling side of things <laughs> that um, it looked great and then, you know, the, the demo was really good and then we got in there and it just wasn't quite working for us. And yeah. um, But by then I had you know, 11 authorised representatives all trying to get their head around how to work it and use it and um, it turned out it was a bit of a wrong direction or, yep. you know, a misstep that we, we yep. made there and... Yep. Um, you know, we've learned from that. Uh, I, I think next time you try and look at something that um, or something looks quite shiny and you want to try it, try and get one person to really try and break it before yeah. everyone else does. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, we certainly had that same issue with modeling because there is just so many things that they show you in modeling that look great. And you're like, oh, yeah, we need to be able to do that. But then you sort of forget about all the other stuff that your existing modeling software might actually do well. Yeah. Yeah. And particularly thinking about what the 90% of what you're going to ask it to do needs to do as well. And the great, like the shiny stuff and the, and all the, you know, the perks are great, but when it does the shiny stuff but doesn't quite do the basic, you know, that you're really asking it to do, it's like, oh, wait a minute, got to go back to the drawing board. <laughs> yeah. You know, been there, done That's that it. and have the T-shirt, I've got to say, absolutely. Uh, now, for you, one of the key factors I'm betting, um, Nigel, for you guys, you are embarking on the, effectively this sort of development, you know, white whiteboard from, you know, blank board from scratch sort of stuff. I'm betting cost played a fairly significant part of your decision-making process. Is that valid? 
Yeah, absolutely. Like we started with, with nothing, so we had to be really careful. We um, raised a little bit of money, but not 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 huge amounts, just to get some. Um, so yeah, we had to be really careful and um, and really put some really strict controls in place to not not start spending money on stuff without really evaluating it and and uh, making sure it was exactly what we needed and what what the test hypothesis was. Yeah. And um, yeah, so um, yeah, it, it's you can blow money pretty quickly in the tech space and marketing space, particularly in the sort of marketing online marketing space. Like we, you can really start to spend money there with no results and they promised the world so learned some lessons there and had to break a few uh, contracts very early on when I realized it was all a bit smoke and mirrors yeah yeah yeah, absolutely and I think it's you know, when you're not in the game, and I absolutely am not either, then, you know, we're comparing it against a little bit of bespoke, bespoke change to something you can pay for monthly. You know, we're used to the, hey, yeah. can we tweak that? Hey, can we add a custom field? But suddenly what you're really doing is actually building a car from scratch. You know, that's not the same as hiring an Uber once a month. Like, like these are two different things. So, you know, suddenly it's like, oh, wait a minute. Okay, I need to approach this differently. So it is I'm, – I'm always hesitant – Um. Uh, when people sort of are talking about bespoke and particularly just for their business, you know, it's like, oh, you're taking on a lot there. You know, that's a different thing. Whereas you guys have gone to go, well, we're going to do this for the market. So it makes sense. You know, you're going to be investing that to then, you know, take it out and, and get further clients. So it makes a whole lot of sense from that, you know, for that perspective. Andrew, I'm curious about you guys. Yeah, and we're really trying to connect. Sorry. No, go ahead, Nigel. Oh, I was just saying, yeah, our view was to try and really connect different parts of technology together and make it seamless. So right. we ideally want, we're not building a lot of this tech from scratch ourselves, but partnering up Cobbling with different together. providers to connect that together. Yeah. And that's easier said than done as well. But like that was part of our view on this, that we weren't going to build a new, you know, a new platform or we weren't going to build a, and spend tens of millions of dollars. But how do we connect all this up and, and make it a, a client facing uh, interface? Yeah. yeah, for sure. So Andrew, for you guys, um, you know, I'm curious. I know for when you've got a lot more authorized reps, which you guys do, there is that that concern with cost only because it's, you know, multiplied by 10 or multiplied by 11 or even mm-hmm. more for admin. Was that a factor for you guys or did you find that really the things that suited you weren't an impost in terms of the, you know, monthly cost? Yeah. So from the outset, we were very conscious not to compare the cost of the proposed solution with our existing uh, services or right. existing tech that we were using. Yep. And the reason behind that is the existing tech wasn't achieving what we needed. So there's no point doing a comparison between what is going to achieve what we need as a business with what isn't going to get us to where we want to be. Yep. So we went in sort of, you know, ignoring that, you know, ignoring what we were currently paying and saying, well, you know, looking forward, what are our options? And what we did is we, we wanted to make sure that, first of all, we found something that had all of the must haves. And it was once we started going through the nice to haves and we worked out who was there that only then would we start to actually consider the cost because there's right. no point comparing a really low cost solution if it wasn't going to cover all of the must haves for us. Yeah. Uh, in the end, when we got down to our final two on the shortlist, the deciding factor was cost between those two options. Yeah. Okay. And so, well, that's a really great structured way to go about it. So you're not, yeah, you're not buying something that actually doesn't meet the requirement anyway, um, but just happens to be cheap. You know, that's, that's, you may as well not move if that's what you're doing because you're not well, meeting well, the requirement, it. right? Yeah. That's it. I mean, it has to achieve what you want it to do. And yeah. then once we start finding a few options that will cover and give us what we're after, then sure, we can start to look at cost, but there's no point looking at it before that. Courtney, how about you guys? Was cost a factor really at all or was it was the function the really, the prime driver for you? Yeah, so obviously cost is important, but I think similar to Andrew, um, it wasn't the the biggest driver in our decision making. Um, first and foremost, we wanted that really good member experience, and then as it turned out, we actually uh, the tool that we ultimately adopted was one that we were already using, just not using to its fullest extent. So, um, and that one was quite expensive. Okay, so it just happened to be something you were paying for anyway. So, you know, the, yeah. net, the net impact wasn't quite so The net painful. impact was minimal. Yeah, yeah exactly. But, you know, we were sort of taking a step forward to use it to its full extent, which meant, I suppose, notionally a lot yeah. cheaper. <laughs> and while we're just talking about that, then also as you were looking, and like you say, you end up you ended up going with something you had, but did you get a sense as you were doing the research that, 
you could really work out where the value in terms of any efficiencies was. I know that wasn't necessarily something you guys were hunting for because it was very much about the client experience and the client interface. But but did you find it became clear quickly where that inherent value was or do you think you've discovered more of that since you've sort of gone forward? Yeah, so as you say, I guess less about making our existing process efficient and more about sort of adding on. So I guess yeah. we were looking – probably more for effectiveness than efficiency yeah. and something that would integrate well into what we were already doing, which, you know, as a result of sort of keeping the existing tool, that that was the case and we didn't have to go through a data migration or retrain right. the team. It was sort of more the add-ons. Yeah. Um, yeah, so really just about identifying a tool that, that could best execute the experience we wanted. In contrast, I'm I'm curious for you, Andrew, whether um, as you were doing that digging, you really started to get a sense of that quantum of impact, you know, whether it started to be, ooh, this feels like this could be a couple of hours saved on this or, you know, that sort of level. Did you get a, a sense of that as you were doing that research and sort of collating it together? Yeah, absolutely. We did. Um, there's a lot of uh, efficiency and effectiveness that can be achieved through having all of our business units in the one CRM. You know, each person within their own customized version of it and seeing only their clients and everything, but at a management level, being able to see what's going on across the business, being able to you know, push client data across between divisions without having to rekey it and enter it all in. That's certainly helpful. Um, there's other efficiencies as well that come with the direction that we've gone um, with uh, that we're still working through. Okay. Uh, there's, there's a bit of a, unfortunately, a bit of a gap in the consulting space out there that actually uh, to stitch the different parts of this together. Right. And we're still sort of trying to work through that at the moment uh, with our CRM provider and um, the, the technology that that backs that. Yeah. Uh, but, I think there's we've achieved a lot so far and there, there will be more to come. Yeah, okay. So, it's probably a combo. You sort of had a good sense of what might be initially worthwhile, but you're discovering more as you go through uh, and you see it sort of get embedded. Yep, that's for sure. Yeah. And I'm curious though, Nigel, for you guys, what like what was the, you know, was there anything that you were looking at that you felt, wow, that's really going to have a, a faster impact or it's going to have more effectiveness for us versus others? Like did that stand out as part of that research and collation process? Yeah, so I actually went full circle. So we actually were searching for that um, sort of that learning system that could sort of be that plug-in. But the difference between just landing on a site and opening up an account, how do we create courses and things like that? And yeah. We actually had a tech provider that was building that, but it just wasn't really what I envisioned. Like it just wasn't flowing. Right. Um, and it was actually a, um, a very a, a good mate of mine who had gone down another path in, in entrepreneur space and I sort of kept an eye on it. Totally different industry, which I – Reached out to him and said, "I think what you guys are doing could really apply here." And um, and they they'd be just gone off to the US and won some big deals over there. And so I didn't think he'd have the time for me either. But he said, "Yeah, this sounds really cool." And and off we went. So um, yeah, it was just one of those weird things where I probably should have reached out to him three years ago. But you know, <laughs> the hard, you know, we sort of trying to build it ourselves and found this solution. And as soon as we had the demo, I went, "Wow, this is," and they're really excited too. So it's giving them a bit of a tangent to Fin Services, which obviously opens up their scope a bit. But um, yeah, but obviously having to modify that for what we're doing, but. Um, yeah, um, but you know, sometimes you just jump on something and go, oh, this, is, this is going to be it. It's not perfect, but we can we can work with it now. Yeah. And certainly um, there really is value going outside of the industry. You just never – particularly when it's not something that's technically, you know, financial services, you know, and, and I think what we think needs to be financial services often is – I mean, even advice document production, you know, that's that's mail merging. Like really in its most simplistic form, it's just mail merging. It's complicated, don't get me wrong, but – you know, yeah, and just their, their different focus on client engagement and stuff like that. Yes. We've been focused on talking to people in the industry who are, you know, obviously we have to have much more of a compliance lens on it yeah. and what can and can't be done, like a lot of no's, whereas you get people who tell you the industry going, yeah, we can do that and you can, that's what clients want and that's what, that, but that's what clients want. And you're going, yeah, of course, well, that makes sense then. Yeah. Obviously, we've got to make it compliant, but like if that's what clients want, let's build it. Like yeah. rather than <laughs> get caught up with the, the, the industry language around, well, it's got to be built this way or that way because, yeah, anyway, yeah. As you as Just you narrowed it down really and you made your choice, were there any trade offs you had to make? Was there anything you had to sort of give up in the final decision that you yeah, found? Absolutely, yeah. Like there's some there's some work to be done still in that in that development which we're working with them on because it was built for a totally different industry. So yeah. it, that's the, that's the challenge, right? It, it was built. With, they never even thought of coming to financial services. So working with them to modify that and even even the little messages that go out to the customers are very like you know 
different and we still got to modify that bit to saying we're dealing with people with who are learning about money and stuff they're not learning how to play tennis you know or yeah. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah so Play the drums, whatever it is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for sure, for sure. I'm curious, Courtney, what the trade-offs were for you guys. So as you went through your list, what were your nice-to-haves that you might have had to give up when you made the decision and decided you'd put them further down the track and, and look at them then? Yeah, so although cost wasn't a driver, I'd say cost effectiveness was something that we did give up. So, yep. you know, we chose to go with a a higher cost solution. Yep. Um and then the other thing is is modeling, sort of as we touched on earlier, a yeah, lot of okay. tools did have that modeling component and the one that we ended up going with didn't have the modeling. So Yeah, okay. How about you, Andrew? What was the sort of trade-offs you guys ended up having to make to really, you know, on that final one, you're like, oh, we're going to have to give up a couple of things to, to get the thing we want? I, there was trade-offs sort of all along the way because <laughs> what we started off with uh, was, you know, the traditional advice CRM is all-encompassing. It's probably actually not a great CRM, but it has the advice tools in it, like right. your, your modeling and your software, your document generation and everything in there to produce advice. Yeah. Uh, then we had to look at that and go, well, everything's there. It's in one place. The data you know, doesn't have to move anywhere versus having a CRM that the rest of the business can use. So that was a trade-off we had to make then. So we realized, well, we're going to have to go to a you know, to a platform that is a CRM and it doesn't try to be everything else. It just yeah. tries to be a really good CRM. Uh, so we we did obviously have that trade-off decision mm. that we had to make at the start. Um, and then as we were moving through that, there certainly were some some good things that we came across, but um, you know, just limitations around having that sort of open APIs and what have you certainly knocked a lot of them out of the process. Yeah. So that sort of integration requirement meant they're just not gonna get there. Yeah. What's gonna be too I mean, hard or maybe too We didn't want to go from we didn't want to end up in a situation where we were saying, hey, we want to go to a CRM that works across the whole business so that we don't have double entry of data everywhere and then end up in a situation where we've just got to go and have that double entry of data somewhere else along moved. the process. Yeah. It, yeah. yeah, so that was certainly something we wanted to avoid. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And look, integration is interesting, isn't it? Because I know, you know, Zapier comes up, up a lot and we actually use it in the business in, in positions, but it isn't actually a full integration tool. It's a great trigger action tool, you know, so it can do a little bit. But if you really want to embed everything, it doesn't get it done. So I'm betting that was probably something you were trying to balance is do we need, you know, does Zapier get it enough or do we need more integration than that? And look, a lot of the time when we were speaking to product providers and they didn't have the open APIs or something, they'd say, oh, but we, we work with Zapier. And I'm like, well, that's great, but it only works if the connection in Zapier does, you know, when action A happens here, trigger action B over there. And sometimes yeah. you look at the available connection and it's there's, there's barely anything there. So yeah. it doesn't really achieve what you're actually after. Look, it's great for certain functionality. You know, we've used it to connect CRMs to things like MailChimp and it, it works fine for yeah. that. But for what you need in terms of actually pushing all client financial data across into a modeling system, it's just not going to cover that. Yeah. Yeah. When you've got a lot of strings across from one to the other, yeah. you know, if there's that many, it's yeah. it's not designed for that. That's not what it's yeah, there I think for. there's something like 420 data points that move from the CRM to the modeling software and you're not Ooh. going to get that through a Zapier. No, not well. <laughs> that's going to – that's and, it's, and the other thing is with those types of connections is they do break. You know, you only need something to change in one of them and, and it's just not going to work. So, yeah, it's interesting. The connection thing is really, really interesting and certainly a big challenge. Um, in terms of then choosing, you know, the final selection, dun, 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 you know, the winner is, um, I'm curious for each of you what the key differentiator in, ended up being. You know, what was the thing that tipped the one you picked over the edge? What did it all sort of come down to? Nigel, for you guys, what did it come down to in that final choice? Um, it actually came down to relationships. So we, we felt that we needed really strong relationships and pretty deep personal relationships with the, with our partners. It was crucial that we, these things aren't always going to be right, but as long as we had a, a pretty strong working relationship and there's some financial, um, connection in there as well that we could always resolve problems. So yeah. one of our biggest partners is people I've known for quite a while. And, you know, we have some good, honest, chats, robust chats, but we were able to solve it. Whereas I think in the early days I was dealing with very arm's length providers and that was really difficult to, yeah. especially when we're sort of trying to work through something quite new. So for me, that that's more important than, you know, they're, a bit, they're not necessarily more expensive than the others, but if they were, that would, that would overlay it, that we can work together and we can find a solution together. Yeah. 
And I, I believe you're also were well, looking sort of for that low code or no code type of solution where yep. you guys could do a lot yep. without needing to fully, you know, open up the computer and look inside it in terms of coding. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm, so I'm not a tech person, so it had to be had, had to do something I could use. <laughs> yeah, and it's interesting because for a lot of people these days, they think that's just how everything works. I mean, we're all used to being now you could build a website just dragging and dropping, you know, and they don't realize that most coding used to list, literally be, you know, backslash D plus four at this, you know, like it's literally typing these codes. So, you know, that's an important differentiator for a tool um, for any of us, let alone for what you guys are trying to embark on for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Andrew, you know, what about you guys? So it sounds like from what you were just saying, it really came about, came down to the ability to be across all of the different business lines, but then also integrate with whatever the unique business line needed. Was that really the end tipping point on the one that you it ended was, up going with? But we ended up with two solutions that could okay. do that. And we had to obviously make a decision between the two. And um, one of those uh, required quite a lot of development work to be able to get the um, the connections in, in there and everything we need to be able to work effectively in the financial services space. Yeah. Whereas the other solution, um, somebody uh, had already gone out and built a financial planning application over the top of that CRM okay. and we were able to uh, use that offering yep. and um, then have the rest of the business sit outside of the financial planning part of it and uh, sit directly on the underlying CRM. Uh, so it's still the same dataverse that um, all the client information is across, mm-hmm. uh, but it meant we didn't have the dev work uh, to build the what we needed in financial planning, uh, which was great. And uh, we were looking at quite extensive uh, development costs um, if we we didn't go down that path. And it's an interesting thing, isn't it? Because when you think that through, that wouldn't necessarily have been a feature like you had in your spec. You know, like you wouldn't necessarily had, hey, we don't need to do development on the spec. But clearly when everything else lines up and it all matches, it just comes down to what's left, doesn't it? It's just like what else is there that they've each got? Well, that's the thing. I mean, if you end up in a CRM outside of the financial planning world, the concept of a household doesn't necessarily exist. Everything's an account. Uh, You know, your um, FDS dates, your fixed term agreement renewal dates, um, you know, client review anniversary dates, all that kind of stuff um, doesn't sit in like a HubSpot or something like that. It's, you know, you can can adjust them and do things, but there's... um, You've got to have those fields in there to be able to run a financial planning business. Yeah, for sure. So, Courtney, for you guys then, you know, what was that tipping point that in fact, as it turns out, made you stay with what you had? What was the thing that was just the, look, this is the right solution for us? Yeah, so there there was a few things. Um, I'd say first and foremost, the app and the ability to tailor the app, as I mentioned earlier. Yeah. Um, the data capabilities as well. So the tool that we use, our, our members can sort of plug in their bank accounts and we can get really rich data on sort of where they're spending their money and that can then help us sort of keep them accountable, which is one of the key things that we were looking looking to implement. Yeah. Um, another thing that, that really tipped us over the edge was the security and privacy aspect. So yeah, okay. the tool that we were using had really robust privacy and, and younger cohorts are so on the ball with privacy. We constantly get questions about it. So yeah. we wanted a, a tool that we could hand on heart say, yep, yeah, we know that this is going to be really secure for you. Um, it's an interesting also- point actually for us as well. We've discovered this because they, they can talk a lot about security and the and the layers they've got, all the you know multi factor, all those sort of things. But you've got to ask more, you know, if you say yeah. trying to get them out of email because that's the risk. But then everything they send as um, a, you know as an element of that factor goes via email. You then go, well, wait a minute, does that meet our requirement? Now that may not be what concerns your business when you look at it, but it, like you've got to ask more questions, don't you? Like there's more to this you than just do. oh that sounds secure. You know, <laughs> it's more questions yeah. to ask. And you're right. I think a lot of businesses are now moving away from email because we don't feel like that is the most secure place or way to communicate with with clients anymore. It certainly so, feels like a Trojan horse, um, doesn't it? Email. It's yeah, like, it really does. Yeah. So which one, which one did – oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, sorry. Sorry, I was just going to say the last factor that pushed us across the line was scalability. So okay. we wanted something that would – 
allow us to sort of grow and as we brought on new members we could facilitate just that. facilitate that so we've we've kept the listeners in suspense or suspenders depending on how you say <laughs> it up to this point um so which one you ended up staying with the one you were using which tool was that yeah the big reveal it was my prosperity <laughs> <laughs> okay and so you'd had it already and then all you've done really is gone a bit harder and lent into it uh in terms of the exactly. way to use the features yeah perfect and yeah. nigel this will be probably something that you know, the listener hasn't heard of before. What was the uh, learning management system you guys ended up going with? Uh, yeah, it's actually a business called Slow Coach. Um, yeah, okay. they're, uh, they've um, built out um, yeah, basically coaching for sports. It was built out of COVID when people couldn't get physical coaching. So they started there and then built out that learning management system built for sports coaching and sports organizations. So, um, and so, yeah, so we've sort of adapted that to, to um, our world. And it's so funny when you first hear that, you're like, really? But actually, the more you think yeah. about it, the more relevant it feels. You know, yeah, like it's yeah. it's oh, well, yeah, really, yeah. it is, yeah. isn't it? Like it's interesting. Yeah, and yeah. we can narrow our, our thinking down um, and potentially yeah. miss out on a great solution. Um, yeah. How about so, Andrew? You've got a couple that you ended up with. What did you? What was your your little tech? You know, stack that you guys ended up coming up with in the end. Yeah, so across the business, we're using the Dynamics or Microsoft Dynamics 365 uh, sales module. And then within the financial planning, mortgage and accounting businesses, they're actually all sitting in FIN 365 as well, which sits on top of the the Microsoft Dynamics uh, CRM. So it gives us the overlays and the the concepts that we need in, um, in those financial services, accounting and property businesses. Uh, which is great. Um, you know, the, sorry, property sits outside of that, I should say. Um, so then what we've done is we've connected that up to uh, Dash and through their marketplace, we're able to use their document generation, uh, Chant West, Product Rex, um, uh, for for the research, and then yep. we've got Voyant uh, as well for our modelling side of things. Yeah, okay, perfect. So that's an interesting choice where you've managed to find both um, the tool that was you know narrowed down for financial advisors, but it happened to be able to be layered on top of something that you know that could go across the business. So that's that must have felt like a yeah. bit of a win when you found that. Yeah, it was. And look, it was the guys at Fin Three Six Five that helped us uncover that that's what we can do. That we can use them for the. F- you know, pure financial services parts of the business mm-hmm. and um, that, you know, sitting on the same dataverse uh, and the same underlying platform, uh, we can have other um, non-financial planning or non-financial services parts of the business sit yeah. outside of that and just use the real direct D365 sales capability, uh, which is, you yeah, know, fantastic for us. Uh, just it took away a lot of the, the extra work that we otherwise would have had to have put into development. Yeah, okay. And given, you know, when you look at that sort of selection phase, so that, okay, we're comparing them and we're selecting, you mentioned the modelling as an example. Mm. What would you have done differently in that? I mean, that's a great example. What would you do differently to try and not have that happen again where it's like, oh, you know what, we're going to have to reverse that decision and pick a different one? Don't rely on demos. See if you can actually get in there and trial something yourself because in a demo, they'll always show you something that works. Yeah. Right? And that can be done. You actually need to have your own real-life client scenarios that you're used to modeling and, you know, some of the simple ones and then work your way up to a more complicated one and have a crack at it that way Uh, because in the demos, it always looks great, but they're going to point you to the the best bits. Yeah. Uh, Then when you actually try and apply it to your business, sometimes it's going to be a bit different to, to what they've shown you in the demo. And that can be on the full spectrum of simplicity or complexity, can't it? For us, we found with modeling, they're all just too complicated. We're like, no, we don't need that much. <laughs> it's taken me longer to enter the enter all the things in to get the output than if I just whipped it up myself. So if we had the reverse issue, but it's really important, isn't it, to put real scenarios in that are real clients so you can see that. Yeah, that's it. I think we... You know, we do have a tendency to overcomplicate the way that we model things. Yep. Like we, you know, we see with um, you know people modeling family trusts, and then they end up distributing all of the income to one person. You could just put the asset under that person's name and get the same outcome. Those sort of things <laughs> yep. that you know we've overcomplicated by trying to create trust distributions and this and that and loans and whatever. And so you are right, but. Um, I think you've just got to get in there and have a go. Yeah, yeah. And so I guess you mentioned before as well, like potentially you've, you've made a choice for something like this that is quite um, yeah. granular, you know, it's not a generic thing, then you'd probably test it, get somebody, you know, one person to start really using it for a bit. Is that another sort of tip you'd give people that, you know, don't yeah. don't go broad on some of these tools until you've let it be tested by one of the team? 
Yeah, absolutely. Because otherwise you potentially end up adopting something that you don't stick with. You've had too many people try and get used to working with it. Also, just be selective with the team member that you decide is going to be the one who has a go at it. Uh, yeah. Sometimes you, you might have a tendency to say, well, I'll give it to my most tech savvy person or the, the person who's the best at modeling. I'll get them to go and test the scenario. Now, sure, they might be able to work it out, but does that mean every advisor in the practice is going to be able to do mm. it? Because mm, this is meant to enhance their modelling skills, really. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Because And it, look, it's so true. Um, we've started doing that. In fact, we're doing a rollout of a project and we've got the most black thumb clients we can find to just see if they can break it for that reason. Because like, that's really where the difficulty is going to be. The keen beans will work it out anyway, you know, for sure. Yeah, that's do- it. And, you know, like I'm happy to pick up some new technology and have a go at it and, you know, because I enjoy looking at it, yeah. I'll, I'll figure it out. Whereas the person who might be a bit more... Um, change resistant or um, not as technologically uh, savvy or yeah, you know, enthusiastic. Yeah, enthusiastic. Yeah, they. You know, maybe that's the person who we should actually get to try and try these things. And if they like it, then we know everyone's going to like it. Yeah, for sure. Nigel, what about for you guys? What would you say you would do differently? I mean, clearly you've mentioned you know you'd you'd probably go out and ask you know somebody you knew well already and and sort of broaden the search is there anything else in terms of that selection process that you'd do a bit differently or you'd give us suggestions for somebody who's going on their own hunt yeah i mean we well, there's lots of things i suppose but i think a key thing that comes to mind was we originally started with like the sort of almost the front page and and how that would look and and then re- learned the hard way that we really had to build from the back back forward so our right. our actual front page we still haven't really to be honest worked a lot on for a while because it was the engine and everything behind it had to work so it's a bit like what andrew was saying it had to it had to work it had to be functional so when we were doing the the demo it just wasn't a pretty powerpoint it was actually this works and yeah the actual home page might might not be the best home page in the world but like yeah. it was more important that we could actually show how a client would go for the journey and that's what sold it rather than a fancy web page that then goes well and that what happens like it looks cool so that was a learning point for us that we thought we needed something flat and sort of, you know, um, fancy at, at the front end and really it was that functional part of it that's more important and the rest can follow and that's actually a much cheaper thing to fix as well. And that's interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, so Courtney, you've been hunting for that client engagement piece, but I bet it is hard not to lean on, ooh, that looks cool. You know, like, like that is tempting, isn't Definitely. it? Like when you first look, ooh, that looks really great. But <laughs> actually, the it doesn't quite get things done very well. So I'm curious if you had some interesting, you know, that was part of what you had to keep in mind as you were going um, when you were doing your digging. Yeah, I, I think for us, um, what I would do differently is probably look at our current suite in more depth first. Yeah, okay. Uh, because that was something that we sort of did, you know, later down the line after we looked at other tools first. So um, definitely don't discount what you've currently got. Find out if what you've currently got can meet your needs. Um, and then the other thing I would say is sort of bring the team on the, on the journey. So, you know, rope them in, get, the, get their input, get members' input and other stakeholders um, as well. Because I'm getting, I'm betting that that probably helps narrow down the decision, you know, and it and I mean, maybe keep you keep you accountable. Um, Definitely, yeah, yeah, both. Yeah, Andrew. So I'm curious, did you find that that you know by being so structured, and you had all of the the features you're looking for, but then maybe you know involving members of the team, it sort of kept you know each each other accountable for what you were really working on, so you couldn't go down the uh, the black hole too often. Yeah, absolutely, and of course each part of the business has its own wants and needs. Right. So, for us, it, it was definitely important to be talking across the different parts of the business and make sure that you know I wasn't just going straight after something that was going to be great for financial planning and the Kui Wealth Partners business, but work against the other parts yeah. of the business. So, <laughs> yeah, we had to make sure it worked for everyone. Um, and that, that certainly helped keep us focused because we'd, we'd have our weekly catch-ups about where we'd be up to with it and um, you know, everybody had their tasks to run away with and come back with you know, the, the next steps and, and yeah. make sure that was completed. And look, it's an important lesson because lots of the listeners may not have a multidisciplinary practice, but often a decision will be made to benefit the advice team that's detrimental to the admin team. That's, I mean, that's often done, right? So it's a similar consideration is to make sure you're considering all of the impact, 
you know, across the group. Stakeholder management's key uh, in these changes. So uh, basically anyone who's going to be impacted or the the leaders of any team that's going to be impacted by the changes need to be aware of it. Um, They might be able to provide their unique perspectives. What you thought might have been a problem by making such a change might actually not be because you're not in there working in that team every day. Yeah. Um, You know, sometimes it actually creates opportunity and we can work through things and you find other areas for improvement as well. Perfect. So now I'm, as we wrap up, I'm, I'm just curious whether you each have any sort of last tips, you know, to streamline the selection process for people that are listening. Is there anything else that you'd suggest they do? Let's start with you, Nigel. Is there anything in particular you'd get them to do or, or decide or add into their process? Um, I think, yeah, I think we have to be um, – the, the process, you know, it, it, the more thorough you can be, the better, obviously, and the more, according to what saying, really understand what you've got now before you, you launch out there. You might find it under your nose. You might find people under your nose already that you know that we discovered that. Um, things that Andrew said are just a really, you know, process-driven and really be thorough. But at the end of the day, you've really got to be curious as well because you don't know what's out there. And I yeah. think that, that – that curiosity while understanding what you've got and having a process around it, but be willing to be willing to have a really open mind that there's things out there that we haven't seen yet and and technology development that's, that's moving pretty quickly. So be willing oh. to willing to um, get out there and explore. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, how about you, Andrew? Any any last tips you'd give people as you know for that selection process that really make might make it that little bit easier? Yeah, I think first of all, work out what your must haves are and the not negotiables and narrow your list down. There's no point going deep into due diligence on something that just doesn't pass those first few steps. So work out who the providers are that might be able to solve the solution. Quickly go through that part where you're working out what are the must-haves. Then you know go into that more detailed analysis on that smaller short list. I think that's really important and it can feel a little overcooked sometimes when you do that, but it's Giving yourself structure like that helps your brain process it, doesn't it? It really helps it work through um, so that once again, you don't get caught up in those those shinies. Courtney, what would be your last tips for people that are in this stage? You know, how can they streamline the decision-making process? Yeah, definitely echo what Nigel and Andrew said, uh, but also just rely on the product providers. So work with these tech teams who know the tech inside and out and say, this is what we want and let them work with you to create that. So I was finding a lot of the tech providers, you know, were sort of looking at us like, like I said earlier, like a bit of a checklist. Yes, we can do this. No, we can't do that. But, oh, maybe this one, we can't do exactly this, we can adjust it so that we can make it happen though. So I think that that made it really easy because I didn't have to go in to the ins and outs of each tech option and sort of go, oh, does it do it? Does it not? You know, right. it was just working with them made it much, much easier. Perfect. Well, Nigel, Courtney and Andrew, thank you so much for sharing this stage of your journey. You've been super generous with your time already. We've still got, you know, two more episodes to go. I can't wait to hear, you know, the listener to hear about how you've implemented these solutions and what sort of trouble you got into in that phase, which is, of course, really where the rubber hits the road, isn't it? But thank you so much for joining us today on Episode 3. Thanks so Thanks much, for having Peter. Us. Thanks. Thanks so much, Peter. Yeah. All righty. Lots of good stuff there, folks. Now, we're lucky to have Andrew Whelan from Dash back again. Thank you, sir, for joining us. Now, I couldn't let it go. I had to. Um, I want to really wanted to bring up with you, Jamie made the comment about using tech to really lift the spirits of grumpy staff, you know, staff yeah. having to just deal with, and we mentioned in the last, last episode, this re challenge. Have you really seen that where, where tech can sort of reinvigorate a practice where everybody feels more on board and energized? Yeah, yeah, that's what we do. It, right? <laughs> <laughs> the tech is hard enough that, yeah. that on its own that if we didn't get a few people that are really happy. So it is really, it's really rewarding when people say, look, this has just helped my business no end and my clients love it. And that's what yeah. I, I particularly like hearing about investors enjoying what it is that we're doing yeah. and having a better experience. Um, it kind of feels like we're working collaboratively. Like advisors get that all the time. It's really yeah. where you get to get Well, it's feedback, true, isn't it? You, know you don't necessarily mean? get that far. The feedback doesn't no, get that far. No, so that's nice. Mm. Um, I, I will say that there is a journey Go uh, implementation, so, yes, and, and this sort of leads on to what we were talking about at the end of the last podcast. Mm-hmm. With um, y- you've got to bring the whole people, the whole business Same on level. the journey because yeah. if you don't, often you can get really good tech, and as good the tech is, someone's going to be grumpy about the shift because yes. there's friction in the shift. Yes. So super rewarding when it happens, but there is almost an inevitable, you know, little dip 
yep. at, around the typically around the three month mark, yeah, right, where you're in and you're committed and it's there's like, no going oof. back, and you've, you've perhaps you know not brought everyone on the journey and yep. starting to get some challenging conversations happening internally. Yeah. So always great when it happens, but they're most regularly, you know, well, particularly if not everyone's been brought on the journey, you get it. We we will get both and then it settles, you know, right. and then everyone, everything's clear. And I guess it's a good point because we're already, you know, two steps in here, which is research. The team can be involved at every stage. You can utilize the team and bring them on board to help with the specification, with the fact finding, to really thinking what do we need? And then you can also bring them along the journey on the research. You know, not that mm. everybody needs to do everything, but yeah. to take them on their journey so they almost are running ahead of you. They're ready. You know, the minute yeah. that you pick one, they're like, please, we want this because we get why. Yeah. And I think that's what makes why I like the dash model because we don't have to bully people into our stuff. Yeah. You know? Like we're not waiting to speak. Yeah. We can genuinely listening to what people want. And then if a, another module – and, uh, in our in our ecosystem, which we will build out hopefully to thousands at some point. Yeah. Right? Like if a, if a bit one fits the business better, then yeah. that's that's what we will put forward. So yeah. it, that's um that's always nice is to be able to actually listen rather than right. wait wait to sell. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, and look, Jamie also mentioned that you know what was interesting for them in their fact finding process, and then when they went started going out to market, is they realised they actually needed less tech potentially mm. than what they had. Do you see that when they, when people go through this process? They're yeah. like, oh, hold on. We've got a lot of stuff everywhere. We can actually yeah. consolidate and narrow this down. Yeah. And it, and it's it's a, that can often be an evolution thing that, that cre creeps up on you where you get someone in and you come in and you get a piece of tech to solve a particular problem and then you turn around four years later and you've got six different providers yeah. you know what what and none of them speak to each other and you like someone like someone in the back office likes this one and you love this for your client meetings and a different advisor doesn't so yeah. you could start to um devolve into <laughs> like a, an ununiform or a non-uniform way of doing business and yeah. as a tech provider for everything so yeah we do see that um, and then when some discipline comes back into the practice, when someone says calls it and says that's it, we've had enough of this, we're gonna we're gonna all get on the same page and work yeah. something through, then actually less tech and often less cost uh, result. Right. I mean, and we all love that. Yeah. Right? In this environment, less yeah. cost. It's it's an interesting thing that we're talking about too, because I think um, you know less tech also means you can have some core partners core technology partners because mm. there's not as many of them. Mm. And there was some discussion with the guests where it was, okay, we want somebody that's almost at the forefront. We want to be getting new stuff and and all the journey that's going on. And where, I mean, I hesitate to use AI where well, it's not necessary to bring it up necessarily, but there's lots of change. Mm. So they want that, but they also want surety. You know, you don't want to be mm. nine or 12 months in and the tech player doesn't exist anymore is that yeah. something you see people asking about like all we the want time. somebody who's sticking around like no, all the all the time and they should yeah and and you know there are there have been some some really big promises made and businesses that have burned a lot of cash and not been yeah. able to survive so yeah. uh, you know we're really clear in that a lot of lot of technology is pre-profit right? right so that if you're looking for profitable tech generally you're talking with big players that have yeah. been around for a long time that have their own scars, right? But the sort of questions I think that are really clever is uh, the, to clever to ask technology is: Are you growing? Like, are you right. growing, and how much buy? And make your own assessment about whether or not that's because in tech, and particularly with platform, we're lucky in that we have a platform as well. Yeah. So really, really, um, you know, really strong business and yeah. growing all the time. So we yeah. are at Dash. We're really lucky that we we grow we grow quickly so we're able to sort of fend that those questions off and make people feel comfortable yeah um but it's the ones that's the ones that 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 have fallen over the really common thread is they stopped growing yeah and they they stagnated early yeah in their growth um yeah but once you get past a certain point it's um you, you're kind of there to stay and look it is it is hard and, and it's i guess the counterbalance so there's the big players like you're saying okay we want surety and then well, the opportunity is for somebody that's just narrow and deep. They've just got one thing they do really well, then you can plug and play. Yeah. Then you can, like, that lets you do that. That's if you've right. Got the core that's stable, then you can plug and that's play. That's right. And yeah. you can take some risks. Yeah. Some niche players. Yes. Um, which will always be there. That's which will always be there. And I, and I think it also makes a really, like, we, we integrate with Product Rex, which is free. And right. I actually speak about this is something that would fall over. They've got advisor ratings now. Like, they're really yeah. solid. But at the time, 
it was wild to see how are these guys are going to make money. They're right. free and they're excellent. Right? Yes. So they're great. Yes. Um, but they've got a different model, right? So mm. you've got to ask the questions. How, did you, how do you make the money? Where does it? And it's all around uh, advertising and those things. Yeah. But for us, it wasn't a threat. Right. It, so being free it was like, because we didn't have to build a module in that place. We could just integrate with them and yeah. we do. And then and then everybody wins. So yes. it's, a, it's a really interesting time for that. It is, isn't it? It's And I'd love to see more unusual solutions or just niche solutions come out in the yeah. future. You know, yeah, that's they exciting. Will. They will. When people just, I mean, you know, Nick's done a great job with that. It's just yeah. solve a problem. Yeah. You know, please, more of you. So now Nigel's discussion was interesting because in his research process, yeah. bless his cotton socks, he was researching something he had never encountered before, didn't know anything about, like learning management systems. It's not yeah. advice tech as much as it's just tech tech. Um, and had to just go out to market. Like, what a journey to go on. That's quite the experience. Is it something that, I mean, I guess you guys don't see it that much because most people are, are playing within advice tech space, but it certainly was interesting to see how um, how much he had to learn and how quickly. Yeah. Hats off to him right? in terms of that. So, particularly because he's running another business, a financial planning business. Yeah. You know, that's- um, He's clearly got 40 hours in his day, not 24 yeah, like the rest exactly. of us. Exactly. <laughs> no, it's really, it's really, uh, it's a really good point. And what people, and I think it came up a few times in the podcast, is that people will often look to other industries yeah. to see, to get inspiration for what is- um, what is working for other, in other industries? So yep. often it can be a distraction, but if you can take inspiration and then bring bring some um, some outside knowledge in, then all the better. But they've done a tremendous job with that CNTM product, so yeah. he's he's been able to spin that up really quickly and been able to find a good market for it. So yeah. which the market desperately needs. That C and D client has just been kind of abandoned by the industry. Not yeah. no fault of the industry, it's been no. regulated out, but. Um, it's badly, badly needed. And look, it's like you say, it's um, it is a process, and I, we do this too, where we go outside. Just like it, it is the inspiration thing. It's well, what else are people doing? Yeah, we're actually a tiny industry. Yeah, in advice, there's yeah. so few of us yeah. that I think going outside challenges our own thinking. It does. But it sounds like even from Andrew's perspective, he still came back into the industry for their selection of a CRM. Which is interesting, and you guys must see that into yeah. Because he he would he landed on micro um, Microsoft Dynamics. Yes, like, so a provider Fin three six five that integrates yes. with ours. So that was cool for his part of the business. But yeah. what he's realised, and what we've realised too, so we're really selective with what we build in our CRM because we're not going to beat Salesforce or Microsoft Dynamics. So Andrew's business is big, 30, 30 people mm. run. So with that comes the need for really streamlined things, embedded telephony, you know, AI yeah. sort of taking notes and all of this sort of stuff can add a real, a lot of value for a big business, less yeah. so for a small business, too yeah. unwieldy. Yes. Um, so going, and then he's got the other parts of his business as well. So going to like a proper Microsoft product will have, add more flexibility for him. Yes. Um, but might not be the right choice for, for everybody else. Well, for someone who's <laughs> just this straight financial planning, yeah. You know, then you you can afford to pay less and get a dedicated provider. Yeah, and I mean that's part of the research process, isn't it? It's, it is. it's and understanding the width and the depth of these solutions. Yeah, and which parts of that you need. Yeah, so that then you don't you know buy a bus instead of a scooter. You know, like it's <laughs> really understanding yeah, yeah, your yeah. needs. Yeah. Um, just because and and it, you can get carried away with a whole lot of features you don't need, which, I mean, we're going to jump into then in the next episode, you know, analyzing your options and then picking one. And that's going to come up where it's, look, how do we make sure we don't get distracted mm. by some shiny stuff? So I'll look forward to chatting to you then. Great.